without any further ado, let's bring up uh, Carbon Robotics. You have six seconds. Take it away. Thank you. Six minutes. It's, it's oh, day no. three. <laughs> you are watching a scene from the film Gravity. It won seven Oscars for its cinematography and special effects. But everyone told the director that these effects were impossible, that they couldn't be done. So how did they render the experience of floating in outer space so realistically? The answer lies in the arms of robots. They used robotic arms as rigs to make these supposedly impossible shots possible. I'm Rosanna, this is Dan, and we started Carbon Robotics to enable these new types of applications, and ultimately to make robotic arms as ubiquitous as computers. Now, today, when you think about robotic arms, you probably picture a factory, probably assembling cars. But robotic arms can be used for so much more. They're the ultimate universal tool, doing anything that your arms can do, only better. The problem is that they're expensive, they're difficult to use, and quite frankly, not that safe. And that's where we come in. We've created Cassia, our kick-ass, trainable, intelligent arm that solves all three problems. Today, the cheapest industrial arm you can get is over $20,000. Cassia has the capabilities of an industrial arm, but the price of a laptop. That's 10 times cheaper. Casia can move over one kilogram anywhere within a one meter work envelope with sub millimeter precision. She has a carbon fiber frame, uh, brushless DC muscles, and more raw processing power than most of the computers in this room. Casia is infinitely customizable. You can transform Casia into a completely different tool just by swapping the attachments at the end. We've made some for assembly, 3D printing, uh, camera control, but you're not limited. You can also create your own. So, once you have your arm, then you have to make it move, which is actually difficult to do. You generally need an advanced degree just to get started. We've made Cassia incredibly easy to train. Simply guide the arm through a motion that it plays back perfectly. For something more complex, you can use our app or other devices like a Leap Motion or Connect. So importantly, you don't need any special skills to get started. So now, of course, once you have an arm that's powerful enough to do something that you want, it can also do something you don't want. So you need to make sure that it's safe enough to operate around people. But the truth is that even the best robotic arms uh, still have to hit you to know where you are. You add sensors, but they still have blind spots and, and dead zones. At Carbon, we've invented a new type of sensor. It can detect a human up to 20 inches away in any direction from any point on the arm. As you can see, it knows exactly where his hand is at all times. We've built this into every surface of Cassia's housing. This makes her the safest robotic arm that has ever been made. The opportunity here is huge. According to SRI, a sub $5,000 arm is the holy grail of robotics. This is the tipping point where massive adoption across a range of industries becomes inevitable. And it's hard to overstate that impact. Take biomedical research, which is still mostly manual. Not only do researchers waste hours by passing by hand, they also make mistakes, the kinds of mistakes that jeopardize results and needlessly cost lives. Robots eliminate these errors. In healthcare, more than 12 million Americans are unable to live independently. For those who have limited mobility, robotic arms can be attached to wheelchairs or workstations and serve as virtual prosthetic limbs, giving them back their independence. And for the independent maker, Cassia empowers them and small businesses with small batch iterative products to compete with the giants like Amazon and Foxconn. But perhaps, perhaps the most exciting applications are beyond our current imagination. Getting started in robotics today requires extensive hardware skills. 
To build CASIA, we had to know mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, embedded design, material science, machining. And because this is the most complex uh, configuration of robot you can build, we also had to know things like control theory, quaternion kinematics, ITOS design. And then on top of that, we each spent over six months in China working directly with manufacturers. Just building one requires a ton of skills. But this is ironic, because the hardest challenges in robotics are actually software problems. And that's why we've made Cassia a developer platform. Our APIs cut the complexity. So if you can, if you can build a website, you can code for Cassia. We've already received over 800 detailed applications for everything from integrating with VR to decorating cakes. It's incredible. And it's proof that when you give people incredible tools, they can do incredible things. And that's the history of technology. It's the history of tools that are industrial and expensive, becoming personal, ubiquitous, democratized. Apple did it for personal computers. Makerbot did it for 3D printing. At Carbon, we're doing it for robots. So go to carbon.ai to be the first to know when Cassie launches. Thank you. All right. Big round of applause for Katya. Judges, I'm going to go ahead and throw to you. What are our thoughts? I'll start. Um, tell me about the IP that you have on that sensor technology to make it safe. Uh, yeah. Do you want to take a question? Uh, so we have filed a patent. Um, it covers the method of manufacture, the method of um, signal conditioning, and also, so we talked about a little bit about like it gave you the high level details that detects your, um, your, your proximity, but it can also be made into control surfaces. So all of the body of the arm, that's just a basic control surface. The wrist, that's a touch ring. You can grab onto that and it knows it's in training mode, or it's a slider and you can interact with the robot in that, in that method. So in addition to the method of manufacturing and how you shield that from the internal electronics and have it not be um, disrupted by the metal components that are inside the body, we've gotten, um, we've filed for a patent on all of that. Can we see a demo? Of the, um, of of the, the um, So we had an error, uh, we had a break in uh, the transit where uh, it looks like either it's an ESD error or components got unseated, but the signals got scrambled. So the demo that we were going to show is the demo that we had in the video of uh, drawing a design on an iPad and then it plays out. So, so you don't actually manufacture that sensor. I could go buy that sensor. What you have is the IP around how you shield it and um, how you manage that within your uh, operating software, correct? No, we, we make the, the sensor. Okay. We don't make every single piece of silicon in it, but... Um, That's true, we don't mind. <laughs> um, there's quite a lot, uh, I love robots too. Uh, there's quite a lot of competition, even in the low-cost arm space. The large companies, ABB has some low-cost arms, and there's other small companies doing startups that have low-cost arms. Um, how do you feel you stack up to, who do you see as the big competition? Uh, so there are a lot of people who are trying to move into the low cost robotic arm space because it's seen as like the next frontier. Um, so the, the competition uh, that's probably the most, uh, th that's the, the most advanced are the companies that have been building robotic arms and they're trying to lower their costs. Um, so far they haven't been able to hit under that $5,000 mark and there are a couple of reasons. One, it's um, one, it's a matter of using components that are expensive themselves. So you have to find ways around using those components. Um, and secondly, it is, uh, I would say, our next, our next value is that we are moving towards a developer platform that lets us create these new types of applications that if you're just working in manufacturing, you, ne you don't necessarily think about. And so for us, when we think about the sort of long-term value, it's in the fact that we're giving developers an opportunity to build applications that they know. We started off building 12-foot arms that had a 10-time work capacity. Our first controls were tuned in a 15-foot room. So that gives us three feet to, um, to not be hit. That was a suboptimal scenario. <laughs> and we took that design philosophy of trying to build a no-compromise arm, not a hobby arm, not something that's just a learning tool, but something that can be used in industry, in production, that's going to have you know, guaranteed MBTFs guaranteed specs and will work in continuous operation and scale that down rather than how can we just toss the cheapest components in. Now, um, you compare yourself to Apple and MakerBot and they sell to consumers. 
are you planning on selling that to consumers and do you have any experience shipping to that market? So we are moving uh, towards consumers as part of our big vision. Um, this is not a product that you would buy at like Best Buy next year. Um, and that's why we're starting with um, people who've already expressed an interest in building what we're building. So these are sort of makers, engineers, artists, some of the people who were like, like us, the original people that we built for, um, and who can work with the products that isn't necessarily right out of the box working perfectly. Um, and as we learn from them, that's how we're moving into being more equipped for the consumer market. We're absolutely selling to industrial customers, but we see the big new markets as things that we haven't thought up yet. Right. And we want to see where, when you give people a new tool, a new skill, something that has been reserved for industry, what new things can up, come up. And we see that as the, as the big future possibility. Can you tell us more about your backgrounds, how you got together, and the rest of the team? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, well, I guess, uh, <laughs> all right, so, so Dan's been building uh, things since he was a child. You picked up your first soldering iron, what, in fourth grade? Something like Microcontrollers that. in fifth grade has built everything from uh, espresso machines to electric vehicles. Um, my background is in software development, so I was an app developer, mobile developer before coming into this. And uh, we met at university, went to Duke University together. We've worked on various hardware projects. And so we're the two founders. And then from there, we've brought uh, computer engineers, um, me mechatronics engineers, and community development on top of that. So you said you were going to sell for less than $2,000. About what do you think is going to be the cost to manufacture? Uh, so we don't release our exact numbers on BOM, but we are set up to do retail should we go in that direction. So we have sufficient margin. Now, uh, I, my eyes aren't that good. Um, can I ask if it's a direct drive or a cable drive, and if it has a force sensing capability on the end or in the joints? Um, there is a, it's a tendon drive. Um, we use a custom tendon that is, if you were to compare it to a, um, uh, a plant, there would be a, um, a, like an aramid, um, aramid phylum, um, a protophylum, and then a uh, fluorocarbon um, uh, actual phylum, and then a urethane cortex. Um, it's similar to some of the things that uh, Intuitive Surgical does for, um, uh, for their Da Vinci Surgical Robot. In each joint, we have a 14-bit um, a, a absolute uh, encoder, additional encoders on the motors, and force sensing built into the motors themselves. Make sure you hold the mic all the way up when you come. All the way up? Like right up there. Like Drake. It's right in there. <laughs> How are we doing, judges? I, I'm good. Everyone feel good? Brady, you look, you got questions. Yeah, I'm curious, what is your manufacturing plan and timeline? So we've spent uh, six months, six of the last, I guess, 14 months in China working with manufacturers, figuring out what those sort of lead times would be. Um, and our plan is for the initial versions, we're going to be doing a lot of our, uh, we, we source a lot of our components um, from China, but we'll be doing just sub-assemblies there in our assembly here. So for our first, uh, for our first line, we're looking to, um, uh, to do the assembly here. Would you add? Um, yeah, we're actually, before we're going into full manufacturing, we're doing a limited beta with um, quite a few users, and we're trying to get to learn from that how do we adjust our specs, what things are in use, what needs to change, um, and based on, so we talk about those 800 applications we have. We have a lot more applications. It's 800 that are full research proposals, and we're picking among the best of those and the most diverse group of those to see what do people actually need. What do they need in the hardware? How do they use it differently? And how can we best meet their needs? After that, it's, it's full production. Do, do you have any investors, or where are you getting the funding to take this to market? Um, well, yes. So at this point, we, uh, we have gone through Techstars, and we've been backed by Hacks, so uh, SOS Ventures and also Qualcomm Ventures, uh, which was great, because working with Qualcomm enabled us to work with the Snapdragon. Going with uh, Hacks enabled us to, to go out to, uh, to China and, and get that set up. But um, we've, what we've done is all under, I think, what, 250,000 we've gotten as far as we have, which is very little amount for a robotics company. <laughs> Good. All right, please give it up for Carbon Robotics. Thank you. Robotic arm for the price of a MacBook. Um, let's bring up our next company, but it's going to take a minute to do that, so I'm going to turn over to you guys. Do you think that focus might be an issue for Carbon, given that they're allowing customers to do anything? Might be hard to, I mean, it's hard to imagine those things, right? But I, I can see the value of a developer's kit, because then you don't have to worry about every, um, every end user, but you just enable them. Right. 
I actually thought that was one of the better parts, the open APIs and, and the fact that you are going to get the applications from the user. I'm not sure there's enough differentiation there to really separate this product from the dozens of others that are out there that are targeting this same regime. So you guys seem to know more about that than I do. What would you say is the closest competitor? Who are they up in the ring against? Well, there's uh, quite a few uh, startups that um, I think I even saw one on the crowdfunding sites. It, of course, it might have been these guys. <laughs> um, uh, but some of the larger companies actually do have some lower cost uh, robotic arms. But I don't think they're as consumer friendly um, as, uh, you know, as um, Carbon has made it. Cool.